educators, great how-to workshops, cutting-edge films, fun activities for kids, organic beer and wine, delicious vegetarian cuisine, and diverse live music. The Marketplace showcases 350 eco-friendly businesses. Recharge your batteries with all the hope, inspiration, and practical ideas you'll find at the one and only Green Festival. The Green Festival is co-produced by GlobalExchange.org and GreenAmericaToday.org. For more information about the new Spring San Francisco Green Festival, go to GreenFestivals.org. This is KPFA Berkeley, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online at KPFA.org. It's 1 p.m. Up next is Terra Verde. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Welcome to Terra Verde Weekly Environmental Radio Show on KPFA or KF- KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is Adrian Fitch Frankel. If you've traveled to a place that has employed the best practices in bike policy, whether it's Davis, California, Berlin, Germany, or Bogota, Colombia, you've probably been surprised and dazzled by some of the possibilities you may have seen. Bike roads that are separated from traffic. Bike subscription services that allow you to borrow bikes wherever you are. Today we'll find out what the Bay Area can learn from best practices and challenges in bike policy around the world. Our guests by phone are John Pooker, also known as Car Free John or the Bicycle Scholar at the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Walter Hook. Executive Director of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy in New York. And in the studio, we are joined by Laura Gatson, PhD candidate in anthropology at Stanford University, who's researching bike policy in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, Laura, why is bicycling, this is an environmental show, why is bicycling an environmental issue? Well, basically, bicycles provide a form of mobility that is much less intensive in terms of its use of natural resources, um, mainly fossil fuels, which are finite, and also cause pollution, as we know nowadays, especially with so much talk about climate change. Um, It's a reduction in in carbon emissions, basically. Um, It also requires less space in the city um, for parking, and just the space required to get around on a bike is, is far less than in a car. Walter, in a lot of Asian countries with large populations, biking is a common form of transportation that's being edged out in some places by motorcycles and other motorized vehicles. What would be the environmental impact if they, if these countries lose bike share? Well, for example, in, in India and China, uh, over the last 10 years or so, there's been an absolute explosion of the use of motorcycle uh, and the, these motorcycles in, in India and China, many of them are two-stroke engines, which are emitting very high levels of, of particulate emissions and other emissions that, that is creating very, very unhealthy living environments. But they also create a, a, a very large amount of noise. Uh, that being said, um, they, they do provide a lot of very low-cost mobility for large numbers of people. So, but but they have essentially replaced uh, regular bicycles uh, to a very large extent. Uh, in China, however, there's been a big backlash against this explosion of motorcycle use because it's it's so degraded the quality of life in a lot of communities that people really reacted to this. Uh, and it also was linked to crime. We had a big uh, crime wave in, in southern China. Uh, a lot of the criminals were using motorbikes. Uh, so a lot of the, all of a sudden the Chinese government really turned on the motorbikes and uh, banned them all together in Guangzhou, and they're selectively banning them in a whole lot of other cities, uh, which in a way has led to a resurgence of bicycle use in some of those cities and a dramatic improvement in the quality of life. But we feel quite ambivalently about such a heavy-handed uh, banning uh, uh, regulatory approach, and certainly that would never go 
down well in very democratic India. All right. Um, so let's first start this uh, discussion out with looking at the main uh, um, types of bike policies that can be implemented. Laura, what are the five basic elements of good bike- bicycle policy? Well, you would start with the facilities, the actual infrastructure that the governments can put in place, the lanes, the parking uh, spots primarily. There's also safety precautions. A lot of that has to do with the regulations about the right-of-way as well. Uh, There's also programs that can promote bicycling and encourage bicycling using more social networking tactics as well as disincentives to driving, which can include gas taxes or taxes on the purchasing of automobiles. And finally, I would say also just having bikes available to people. There's parts of the world where people can't afford bicycles. Um, And there's even here in the Bay Area, there's efforts to recover, restore and redistribute bicycles. John, um, I would like to start out uh, with uh, your reaction to a quote that I found very provocative in a Scientific American article titled How to Get More Cyclists on the Road. And you were also quoted in this article, but the quote that uh, really caught my attention uh, was um, one from Jan Gerard, a senior lecturer at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. And um, she said, if If you want to know if an urban environment supports cycling, you can forget about all the detailed bikeability indexes and just measure the proportion of cyclists who are female. What would you say about that? I think she's absolutely right. Uh, She calls women an indicator species, actually, for cycling. She's a friend and a colleague of mine, and we're working on various publications together, and she's done a lot of research in just this area. And what you find is if you find a a place like the Netherlands or Denmark or Sweden uh, or Germany where you have about a 50-50 mix. You have as many men cyclists as women cyclists. You find overall very high levels of cycling, extraordinarily high levels of cycling safety, a very comfortable environment for for cycling. Almost everyone then in that sort of an environment feels comfortable and safe cycling and you get a very high level of cycling. So the answer is I agree with her 100%. Now, my understanding is that one of the biggest indicators of whether women will be cycling is whether one of the bicycle facilities available is off-road, kind of physically separated bike paths. Can you tell us what those are like? Well, uh, there's two kinds. One is truly a bike path that maybe is through a park or is physically separated from the roadway but parallel to the roadway. There's two different types. But another kind is a so-called cycle track, which is on the street, but there's a barrier, maybe a concrete barrier or posts of some kind that separate that bike lane from the motor vehicle traffic. And the advantage of Either of those kinds, either a separate bike path or a protected, physically protected bike lane, is that it it separates you from the motor vehicle traffic and about 98% of cyclist fatalities, in fact, and most serious injuries as well, are due to crashes with motor vehicles. And so I think most people, whether they're cyclists or not, have the main fear of the motor vehicles and really want separation. And Jan Girard, the, the scientist that you cited there, as well as two other women colleagues of mine, one at UC Davis and the other at Portland State University, have been doing research on exactly this. What do women want when they're cycling? And they really want that separation. Every single study that they've looked at or done themselves show that women, for whatever reasons, really want to be separated from the motor vehicle traffic when they're cycling because that is the main source of serious danger. And by the way, I share that preference. And that's why I think that Jan Gerard's quote that women are an indicator species and if you want to get a large percentage of the population to cycle, you need to do something to get women to cycle, but that would also get children to cycle, it would get seniors to cycle, it would get risk-averse people to cycle, it would get people with disabilities of certain kinds to cycle. It, I think really it is a key strategy to increase the this, this proportion of the population that you have cycling is, in a way, satisfying the needs of women as well. All right. So, uh, as we can see, uh, equity is actually one of the big issues that comes up in cycling. Um, another issue of equity, with with an excess with equity, is about wealth and biking. Walter, in the rural areas of 
of Africa and Asia, where you see roughly comparable income levels in bo- on both continents, you see very different trends in terms of biking. Why? What are those trends, and why is that? Well, that's a, a question that uh, ourselves and many other researchers have been wondering about for a long time. And what seems to be the case is, uh, well, first of all, your your uh, your African countries are, as a general rule, quite a bit poorer, so money is a factor. They're also a lot lower density. So if you look at a, uh, the way uh, African villages are spread out, they're, they're really very far from one another. The distances between the, 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 the fields and the nearest town are, are very long. Uh, so, so bicycling as a mode, uh, to, to carrying loads or anything else, is, is slightly more onerous. As a result, there's, uh, there's lower numbers of people who can afford bikes, and there's lower numbers of people who would choose to use that mode as a, as a, as a very convenient option. Uh, because of that relatively weak demand for the bicycles, no industry really emerged to supply the bicycle. So, uh, for example, uh, in China now, 60% of the world's production of bicycles comes from China. So if you're a Chinese peasant, uh, you can buy a Chinese bicycle for $20. To buy that same Chinese bicycle in Africa, which, by the way, is the bike you would buy, uh, it probably costs you uh, $100 or $200 because that bike is going to go through several levels of, of middlemen before it's going to reach you in the market. And in Asia, do you have kind of shorter distances? Uh, well, the, if you look at, say, uh, Ch- China or, or India and the real population uh, zones, for example, the river basins, which have all the fertile land, the villages are extremely dense and they're very close together. So you have much higher levels of population density in the uh, in the fertile parts of, 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 of China and India. And that essentially meant that, that biking became very, very viable uh, for very large numbers of people, which created a very big domestic m- market. So, so the Chinese then could mass produce bicycles at a very, very low cost. This is Adrian Fitch Frankel, and you're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. You're listening to John Pooker of Rutgers University, Walter Hook of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, and Loris Garçon. Uh, PhD candidate in anthropology at Stanford University. Um, Laura, you've also looked at some issues of um, the relationship between wealth and biking. You've found in your work that bicycle riding is actually stigmatized in Bogota and um, and there's a relationship to social class. Can you uh, describe that tendency? Yeah, I would say that because the vast majority of the the residents of the city of Bogota do not own cars, it's about Upwards of of 80% do not own cars. So to have a car is an indicator of a certain amount of wealth. And I actually, I remember now a friend of mine who is a highly educated um, young entrepreneur who said, it's not so much that a bike suggests that people are poor, it's that a car shows that you have money. So the car being such such an important status symbol um, basically leaves the bike as as an indicator of of poverty, not necessarily... um, dire poverty but uh, a sense of limited options and so it, it's a real challenge for people for all of the bike advocates anybody trying to promote bicycling to overcome that cultural concept that exists there and um, what do you think are some of the the solutions to to you've been looking at um, some of the, the the cultural trends that might move things in a different direction well, for one example, in the past three years, there's been a growing number of young university students from the um, wealthier upper class neighborhoods of, of the city that are starting to get together and ride using the very impressive um, sort of world class bike network, the bike lane network that exists there to promote the use of those lanes and also just to show their their peers and counterparts that that biking is something that could be a matter of choice, not necessarily necessity, and that that has really uh, done a lot to improve the image of the bicycle, but it's still a small percentage of the population that has the option to bike that's actually choosing 
to bike when they have the option to to take a bus or a taxi or a car. So it's kind of a cool hipster kind of thing that is kind of impacting the culture. Would you say? Or? I don't know if I would say that you're getting quite to the to the level of hipster that you would see in a place like the Mission in San Francisco. But there is definitely a lot of contact with. Um, cultures in, in other parts of the world. A lot of uh, folks in, in Colombia have traveled to other parts of the world. I also had a friend who did some studies for a few years in Australia and came back to Bogota and tried to launch a critical mass there because he had seen it there in Australia and, and thought it was a great idea. So when people go to you know places like New York or Madrid or any, any other major city where there's a growing bicycle movement amongst the youth especially, they are inclined to want to recreate that in their city and thankfully the city has the infrastructure to make it possible too. John, um, one of the public policies in the toolbox um, is, is this issue of, of creating a culture of cycling. Um, I always thought that biking was more popular in Europe because it was always popular, but you've observed that biking was popular in Europe, then it went through a slump, and then it became popular again. What public policies enabled Europe to create that cultural shift um, to make biking more popular again? Well, first of all, just just a little bit of timing here. Sort of in the 1950s and the 1960s, we had a tremendous decline in bicycling in most European countries. And then around the beginning of the 1970s, you have the beginning of the energy crisis, environmental crisis, concerns with declining central cities. And countries such as the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, and so forth, decided the car is ruining our cities, and they decided to create car-free zones. They traffic calmed their neighborhoods, meaning they reduced the car speeds to 20 miles an hour, or about 30 kilometers an hour. Um, they then created a whole network, uh, or expanded and improved the network of separate bicycling facilities. So, for example, in the Netherlands, probably most Americans figure that, well, they always had bike lanes and they always had bike paths. Well, the Netherlands tripled the mileage of their bike paths between the 1970s and the 1990s. In Germany, they quadrupled the number of the length of their network of bikeways and bikeways. So they invested very, very heavily in bike lanes and bike paths on the one hand. At the same time, they also restricted car use by raising taxes on gasoline, making parking less available, more expensive, creating really extensive car-free zones in the centers of cities, traffic calming neighborhoods as well. Plus, I think something really important that we completely ignore in the United States, and that's safe education, safe cycling and walking education in the schools by the third or the fourth grade. Every Dutch, every Danish, every German kid has had extensive training in safe cycling. Whether you're a boy or a girl, you get it. And so from the very get-go, from the third or the fourth grade, you learn how to cycle safely, and that's the main way you get to school. So it's a really a whole package of policies. There's others as well I'm not mentioning here. The list goes on and on. But it's, it's a combination of what's called the policy sticks and the policy carrots. On the one hand, you want to provide a very safe environment for cyclists and at the same time restrict car use because cars are actually, I think, the main inhibitor of cycling. It's the main danger if you're cycling on the road, crossing an intersection, whether you're walking or cycling, actually, it's the main danger. It's the motor vehicle. So it's, it's a key aspect of this policy package is to restrict car use, slow down cars, however you have to do it. All right, Walter, I um, I read about a program, I, I'm pretty sure it's a program of, of yours, it was on your website, um, about a project in South Africa, in the township of Kailicha, where um, you were uh, uh, trying to increase bike usage by women and promote a culture of biking. Uh, can you tell us about that project? Well, the, uh, we, we started a program in Africa to... Uh, to essentially go directly to some Chinese manufacturers uh, and bring uh, container loads of bicycles directly uh, into uh, an African country so we could reach economies of scale and then distribute them through small independent bike retailers uh, as a way of getting the cost of very good quality bicycles uh, significantly reduced. 
And uh, we, we, while we did that, at the same time, we convinced uh, several government agencies, including the national government, to actually invest in uh, bicycles for certain kinds of service providers. So, for example, the, the national government of South Africa began a program called Shova Kalula, where they made a commitment to give uh, something in the order of a million bicycles to school children uh, based on the kids who lived farther away from the school. So this then became a supply mechanism for that program. Uh, certainly they never reached those numbers, but they did move tens and tens, and tens of thousands of bicycles to school children. There were a lot of smaller programs uh, of a similar type done in partnership with other groups, and the group in Kyoichi, as I recall, was a, a group of uh, women. Uh, they were a, a group of healthcare workers uh, that were essentially uh, taking care of people with uh, with AIDS and other illnesses who needed to be checked up on with their medication. And we, we uh, with a local sponsor, uh, donated uh, a bunch of these. Uh, mass imported California bicycles to, to the healthcare workers and it essentially doubled the number of people that they could visit on a single day. So that was then a model that was adopted uh, by USAID and other people uh, essentially to improve the healthcare logistics uh, delivery systems in, in Africa. Um, John, compared to, you know, often on our program, we, you know, do cover sometimes, uh, as you can imagine, global climate change issues. And, um, you know, a lot of these, the solutions that are proposed are very complicated and you're not sure of the outcomes. And, you know, will carbon sequestration work for quote unquote clean coal? Will carbon offsets thousands of miles away make a difference? Blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, like researching this program and reading about bike policy, I look at these, you know, they're four or five types of bike policies. They're very simple. They're relatively cheap. We know the outcomes. And it, it kind of was shocking to me. Um, and um, and not only that, but um, as you pointed out in your work, you it will address a wide variety of health issues ranging from obesity to asthma. Um, why aren't governments around the world showing aggressive leadership in adopting these policies? Well, that's going to be a controversial issue. I can tell you why they should be. I think I also suspect why they aren't. And that is um, it's just more profitable for big corporations to make cars than it is to make bikes. That's actually the sad story of it. I think there's a lot of corruption, by the way, in developing countries, which lead to the same sorts of things. But there's a lot of corruption in developed countries as well. And I just I think part of it is that what makes sense for human beings, for society as a whole, for the environment, which is the bike. I mean, it's, it's the zero emission vehicle. We've got it right here, right now. It's healthy for us. It's good for the environment. It's good for equity. It would increase mobility of seniors, of children, and so forth. And yet, we don't implement those policies nearly to the to the set to it enough. Um, and I think the reason is there's a lot of corporate power that is against this. That they. Big corporations are making mega billion dollars or whatever currency it's in, making cars, servicing cars, selling gasoline, and destroying the environment. And this is going to sound really terrible, but corporations make a lot of money from traffic accidents and fatalities as well. It's a very, very sad fact. Um, and unfortunately, from a capitalistic point of view, bicycles aren't as profitable, obviously, I don't think, as, as making cars. And 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 that these capitalist corporations aren't paying the tremendous economic, environmental, and social costs that cars impose on, on all of society. So I think that's the reason why they don't. But I think there's some good reasons why we can somehow convince the public and maybe the media to do more to promote cycling and walking and to reduce car use. And that I think that health issue is so important. I think I mentioned to you that uh, for every hour you spend cycling, 
or walking, you add more than an hour to your expected healthy lifetime, which means your lifetime without a major disability. Every single public health study I have ever seen shows how good walking and cycling are for your, your health, your physical health, your mental health. And so even on an individual basis, but also on an environmental basis, on a social basis, promoting walking and cycling makes a lot of sense. And somehow we have to organize and get together a coalition to support more walking and cycling and to oppose the interests of corporations who are only interested in profits and just don't care the least bit about what happens to the environment. Laura, uh, what created, but, but we've been talking about Bogota and we actually haven't gotten into the fact that Bogota is actually uh, one of the best bicycling cities in, in the world. Um, what created the political will in Bogota to um, invest such a large amount of money into to uh, such a fabulous bicycling uh, network. Well, I don't know if this is what everyone's going to want to hear, but in my analysis, and, and this is pretty much common knowledge for folks that have looked into the story, is it was basically a few enlightened officials. It was um, a very rare story, actually, of a couple of heads of government, um, in this case the mayor of Bogota um, at the time in the mid-'90s, named Peñalosa, who wanted to, to see this drastic change and, and went ahead and um, was able to work with some surplus in the budget and, and uh, implemented the changes, set up the infrastructure and made it happen. It really wasn't a case of the, the social, you know, the civil society pressuring the government to do it. Um, so that, that was basically how it went there. All right. Um, we're pretty close to the end of today's show. And um, I actually I have to say that one thing I would love to get on here, John, we only have about 30 seconds left in today's show, but could you just tell us what Ray LaHood, uh, um, Secretary of Transportation for the Obama Administration, said recently, just the quote that he... He said that finally walking and cycling should be treated on an equal basis and given at least as much priority as cars in our society, that they're really important for the environment, for mobility, and that it's about time that we give walking and cycling the funding and the priority that they deserve in our transportation system. And I completely agree. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Walter, could you please give us your um, web address and the mainline phone number for uh, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy? Sure. Um, we are at www.ipdp.org, uh, and we're at 212. 212- Six two nine eight zero zero one, and uh, Enrique Peñalosa is actually the president of ITP, so we were very happy to hear some props given to him. Uh, and uh, if anybody would like to know about what they could do to promote cycling, uh, particularly outside the United States, uh, please uh, uh, approach us. We'd be very happy to try and get people involved. All right, John, um, you're at Rutgers. Can you please give us uh, your website address and um, the ph- mainline phone number for the Blaustein School? Okay, I can give you my, my phone number. I'm not sure if I know by heart my uh, website address. But if oh, you I've got it hand. for you. Okay. All right. So, um, so John is at policy.rutgers.edu slash faculty slash Pucher. And Pucher is spelled P-U-C-H-E-R. And I'm going to repeat that one more time. Policy.rutgers.edu slash faculty slash P-U-C-H-E-R. And their phone number is 732-932-5475. Um, all right. And um, Laura, you had two websites, and then we've got to get off the air. Yeah, I wanted to put the word out for two local organizations that do great work with bicycle education and mechanics training. They have um, awesome work trade programs. It's Cycles of Change, spelled exactly how it sounds, at dot org and bikes for life that's a four the number four bikes for life dot com all right that's all, all the time we have for today's show thanks to eric for being our engineer and this show and others are available from kf kpfa for your convenience have a great weekend Je
officially invite you to celebrate the Asian Law Caucus 38th Annual Benefit Dinner on Friday, April 9th at 6 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in San Francisco. The 38th anniversary event is a celebration of the nation's first legal and civil rights organization serving low-income Asian Pacific Americans. Keynote speaker is Arya Nair, president of the Open Society Institute and co-founder of Human Rights Watch. Please register online at www. AsianLawCaucus.eventbrite.com or visit our website www.AsianLawCaucus.org for more information. The Asian Law Caucus serves our wider community in program areas supporting various projects, employment and labor, housing advocacy, immigration, juvenile justice, and national security and civil rights. This event was made possible by the generous contributions of our benefactor sponsor, Manami Tamaki, LLP.